Chapter 10 First Favors I need to tell you about my first fleeting yet undeniable tastes of God. Sometimes, when I was visualizing Christ inside of me, or even if I was just reading, the unexpected presence of God would sweep over me in such a dramatic way that I could not possibly doubt that He was within me or that I was enfolded by Him. This was not any kind of vision. I believe they call it a mystical experience. In this state, the soul seems to be suspended totally outside itself. The will still loves. The memory is practically empty. And the intellect, though not completely lost, ceases to function, standing in amazement of all it suddenly understands. It seems that God wants the mind to know that it knows nothing at all of what He is communicating. Before this, I would frequently experience a deep devotional tenderness. This is something we can partly attain, I think, through our own efforts. It is a God-given gift that belongs neither totally to the senses nor completely to the spirit. I have noticed that we can sometimes trigger this state by reflecting on our own insignificance and on the awesome greatness of God. It also helps to think about how much Christ has done for us, about the intense pain of His passion and the sorrows of His life, and to rejoice in the recognition of His good works, His nobility of being, and His boundless love for us. If we really want to make progress on the path, there are many other blessings that we may often stumble upon, even when we are not seeking them. When we engage in spiritual practice with love, our souls are uplifted and our hearts are softened, which may stimulate a gentle upwelling of tears. Sometimes our tears seem forced. Other times, it seems like the Beloved is drawing them out of us and we cannot resist Him. His Majesty appears to reward us for our small efforts by blessing us with the sweet relief of weeping for love of so great a Lord. This does not surprise me. The soul has ample reason to find comfort in a love that surpasses all understanding. Here, the soul finds solace. Here, she finds joy. A comparison comes to mind at this point, and I think it's a good one. The joys of prayer must be something like the joys of heaven. Souls in heaven perceive only as much as the Lord allows them to perceive, in proportion to the merits they earned when they were alive. Realizing how small her virtues are, each soul is content with whatever place is given to her. There is an even greater difference between one heavenly joy and another than there is between various spiritual delights here on earth. Following those moments in which God opens the heart during the early stages of the spiritual path, the soul truly feels that she has been more than compensated for her service to Him and there is nothing left for her to desire. She would be more than correct. Remember, a single instance of these holy tears is so powerful that it cannot be purchased with all the trials in the world. While we seem to play some part in attaining this state of tenderness, we can accomplish nothing without God. And what greater reward is there than to be given evidence that we are in some small way pleasing our Beloved? Let anyone who has come this far recognize our debt of gratitude and praise God. For it seems that God has chosen us for His kingdom, and that if we do not turn back, He will take us into His own house. We should try to avoid false humility, which I'll say more about later. For instance, we may think it's humble to pretend not to notice that the Beloved is bestowing sweet gifts of grace upon us. Let me make something perfectly clear. God is giving us these blessings irrespective of our merits. Let us thank His Majesty for them. If we do not acknowledge what we are receiving, our hearts are not awakened to love. The more we remember our poverty, then the richer these gifts make us feel, rendering our humility more genuine and advancing our spiritual progress. Another mistake the soul makes is to be afraid of grace. We assume that we are unworthy of receiving divine favors. Then, when the Beloved begins to grant these blessings, we worry about spiritual pride. We need to trust 
that the one who gives us these gifts also gives us the grace to discriminate when the spirit of evil tries to tempt us in this way, making us strong enough to resist the temptation. All we need to do is walk in simplicity before God, striving to please Him alone. We seem to love other human beings most when we remember the kindness they have shown us. Now, it is righteous, in fact, it is laudable, for us to remember that we owe our being to God, who created us from nothing and sustains us. It is correct and commendable for us to reflect on Christ's passion and His death, which He suffered for each of us living today, long before we were created. Why, then, would it be wrong for me to notice and understand and frequently ponder that, when all I used to talk about was trivial? Now the Beloved has granted me the desire to speak only of Him. Here is a jewel that has been given to us in love. When we remember that we have it, how can we fail to be aroused to love the one who gave it to us? Love is the fruit of prayer that is grounded in humility. Wait until we receive other, even more precious gifts. Some souls who serve God, for instance, are rewarded with an abiding detachment from the things of the world and even from themselves. Acknowledging God's boundless generosity, such people are undoubtedly moved by even deeper gratitude and inspired to be of even greater service. They must be aware that they have nothing to do with any of these blessings. Personally, I would have been more than satisfied to have received a single spiritual jewel. And yet the Beloved chose to bestow more riches than I could ever begin to desire on a soul as undeserving as I. We must be sure to draw from every blessing the fresh strength we need to be of service. And we must always be grateful. For the Lord gives us these treasures on the condition that we make good use of His gifts. If we do not rise to the high state to which He lifts us, He will take it all away again, and we will be left poorer than before. Then His Majesty will give those jewels to someone else, who will display them properly and use them both for her own benefit and for the good of all. How can people make good use of their riches and spend them generously if they don't even realize that they are rich? In my opinion, it is impossible, given human nature, for anyone to have the courage to do great things if he is unaware that he is favored by God. We are pathetically attached to worldly things. Unless we realize that we already have divine things in our possession, how can we succeed in detaching ourselves and walking away from the attractions of the world? By pledging heavenly gifts to us, the Beloved replenishes the strength we ourselves have drained through our transgressions. Until we have some promise of God's love, we will have trouble bearing the universal disapproval and persecution suffered by those of us on fire with living faith. Our nature is so dense that we tend to go after whatever we see dangled in front of us. And so, it is these favors from God that ignite and strengthen our faith. Of course, it may well be that I am erroneously measuring others against myself. Others may find that the truth of perfect faith is enough to inspire them to do perfect things, whereas I'm such a poor wretch that I need much more. In fact, I need everything. Everyone must speak for herself. All I can do is tell you what happened to me, as I have been ordered to do. If the person who is reading this does not approve, he can just tear it up. He knows better than I what is wrong with it, but I implore him, for the love of the Lord, to publish what I have said about my miserable little life up to this point. I hereby grant this permission to him and to all my other confessors. They are welcome to publish this now, in my own lifetime, so that I will no longer be deceiving the ones who believe there is some good in me. Insofar as I understand myself at all, I assure you that this would give me great comfort. I do not, however, authorize the publication of anything I say from this point on. If they show the next part to anyone, please do not tell who it is that wrote it or whose experiences it is describing. This is why I do not mention myself by name and why I have conveyed all this in such a way that it would be difficult for most people to identify me. For the love of God, I implore you to honor my privacy. If the Lord gives me the grace to say something good here, 
in which case, of course, it is his and not mine at all, then the authority of such learned and serious men as you should be sufficient endorsement. I am not learned, nor have I led a good life. I have not even had instruction from learned men, or from anyone else, for that matter. Only those who commanded me to write this know what I am working on, and they are not here to guide me right now. I almost have to steal time to write, and I do so with some reluctance because it gets in the way of my spinning. We are a poor monastery here, and there is so much work to be done. If the Lord had given me greater intellectual capacity and a better memory, I might have benefited from the things I've heard and read. But I have retained very little. And so, if I have said anything right, it is because the Lord has willed it for reasons all his own. If, however, I have said something wrong, the fault is entirely mine and you can simply strike it out. Regardless of the merits of the things I say, there is no advantage to revealing my name. During my lifetime, of course, it would not be appropriate to talk about anything good that I might have done. And after I am dead, there would be no point in mentioning my association with such things, since to do so would only devalue their goodness. Besides, who would ever believe that such a lowly person as I would be involved in such exalted matters? I do have confidence that for the love of God, you and the others who read this manuscript will respect my wishes. That's why I'm expressing myself so freely. Otherwise, I would have terrible qualms about telling anything other than my sins, which I have no hesitation in admitting. As for the rest, just being a woman is enough to make my wings droop, let alone the fact that I am such a wicked one. Since you have insisted that I give some account of the favors God gives to me in prayer, it is up to you to make sure that what I say is in conformity with the truths of our holy Catholic faith. If it is not, I am willing for you to burn this immediately. And I will say what has happened to me so that if it conforms to these truths, it might be of some use to you. If it does not conform, then you will disillusion me. And if it turns out that I am not gaining what I think I am, at least the spirit of evil will not gain it. The Lord knows well that I have always been a seeker of the light. No matter how clearly I wish I could speak about contemplative prayer, it will remain obscure to anyone who has not experienced it. What I will do is describe certain obstacles people commonly encounter along the path and some other dangerous things the Lord has shown me through experience. Recently, I have been discussing these things with men of great learning and other people who have spent years living spiritual lives. They acknowledge that although I may have navigated my path poorly and often stumbled, His Majesty has given me more experience in 27 years of practicing prayer than most people receive in 37 or even 47. Of course, their progress is probably the result of regular penance and consistent virtue. May he be blessed for everything, and may he make good use of me. My Lord well knows that all I want is for people to praise him and magnify his name when they see that he has planted a garden of sweet flowers on such a dirty, stinky pile of manure. And may he grant that I not pull these beauties back up by their roots through my own unconsciousness and fall right back into being the way I used to be. I beseech you, for the love of our Lord, to pray for me, since you know me far better than you have allowed me to reveal myself here. Part 2. The Four Waters Chapter 11. The Garden Let's talk now about the ones who are beginning to become servants of love. This is exactly what happens to us, I think when we take up the path of prayer with determination and follow He who has loved us so much. This is such a high station that the very thought of attaining it transports me with a strange exultation. If we conduct ourselves correctly during this early stage, all insipid fears vanish. O oh Lord of my soul and my good, there are souls so determined to love you that they gladly abandon everything else 
to focus on nothing but loving you? Why don't you want them to immediately ascend to a place where they may receive the joyful gift of perfect love? Wait, I said that wrong. What I ought to be complaining about is that we ourselves don't want this grace. If we fail to reach for this state of sublime dignity, it's our own fault. Don't we realize that the perfect possession of true love of God brings every blessing with it? We are so slow and so stingy about giving ourselves completely to God. Why should His Majesty desire to give us something so precious as perfect love? We need to pay the price of rigorous self-preparation. It is clear to me that there is nothing on earth with which we could ever purchase such a divine blessing. Yet, if we do all that we can, if we avoid getting attached to worldly things and concentrate exclusively on heavenly things, as the saints have demonstrated, then I believe without a doubt that this great gift would swiftly be given to us. The problem is, we think we're giving all that we have to God when all we are offering Him is the interest or the fruit, while withholding the capital or the orchard itself. We may surrender to our poverty, and this is a good thing, but then we often obsess on having enough of what we've given up. Sometimes we even scheme about how we're going to store up some extra or cultivate relationships with people who will ensure that our needs are met. All this does is put us in a greater state of anxiety, and maybe even danger, than we suffered before we freed ourselves from bondage to our possessions. We may also renounce our self-importance when we embark on the spiritual path in pursuit of perfection. Yet the minute someone challenges our good name to the slightest degree, we forget that we have offered up our personal status to God and try to snatch it right back out of His hands, so to speak. Hadn't we just finished appointing Him Lord of our wills? This happens with everything else, too. What a charming way we have of seeking God's love. Our hands are already full of our own attachments. We make no effort to lift our affections above the earth and carry them to fulfillment, and yet we demand spiritual comforts. These two desires, the divine and the personal, strike me as being mutually exclusive. Since we are incapable of giving ourselves up whole, we will not receive the whole of the heavenly treasure. May it please the Lord to give it to us drop by drop, even if receiving it cost us all the trials in the world. Whenever God gives a person the grace and the courage to strive for this blessing with all her heart and soul, he is bestowing the greatest mercy. God does not deny Himself to anyone who perseveres. Little by little, He increases her courage, ensuring that she will reach her goal. I keep saying courage, because in the beginning the spirit of evil erects many obstacles to prevent us from setting out on the path. The spirit of evil knows that if it lets this one soul get away, it is sure to lose many others. I truly believe that if a beginner strives, with the help of God, to reach the summit of perfection, she will not reach heaven alone but will bring many souls home with her. Like a good captain, she will deliver everyone in her care to God. The spirit of evil creates so much chaos along the way that if the soul has any hope of not turning back, she will require not a little courage, but a lot, and plenty of help from God as well. Let's take a look at the early stages of the path. For those who are determined to pursue this blessing and emerge from this adventure victorious, the beginning is the most difficult part. The soul struggles and God responds with a flow of grace. In the more advanced degrees of prayer, our primary task is simply to enjoy God. Still, whether we find ourselves at the beginning, middle, or final stage of our path, we all carry our crosses even though no two crosses are alike. All who follow Christ must walk the path He walked if they don't want to get lost. Blessed be the trials that even in this lifetime are so abundantly rewarded. At this point, I'm going to have to resort to metaphor. Since I am a woman and only writing what I have been ordered to write, I hesitate to speak this way. But it is difficult to get the language of the Spirit just right, especially for someone like myself who is uneducated. And so, I will have to find some alternative means for expressing myself. 
It may be that my metaphors are ineffective, in which case you can use my foolishness as the opportunity for a good laugh. It seems to me that I have read or heard of this metaphor somewhere, but since my memory is so poor, I have no idea where it comes from or what it was meant to illustrate. So I am content to borrow it for my own purposes for now. Let the beginner think of herself as a gardener who is preparing to plant a garden for the delight of her beloved. But the soil is barren and full of noxious weeds. His Majesty himself pulls up the weeds and replaces them with good seed. Bear in mind that the minute the soul sets out on the path of prayer and service, God has already begun to cultivate her soil in this way. Like good gardeners, our job is to tend those plants with loving care, striving to get them to grow. We labor to water them so that they will not wither, but instead bud and bloom, emitting the most sublime fragrance and giving this Lord of ours great pleasure. This inspires him to enter often into our garden and enjoy himself amid the array of virtues. Let's see now how this garden needs to be watered. In this way, we will understand what we have to do, the price we have to pay to do it, whether the gain exceeds the cost of labor, and how long we might expect to have to work before our efforts come to fruition. It occurs to me that our garden can be watered in four ways. We can pull water up from a well. This is a lot of work. Or we can turn the crank of a water wheel and draw the water through an aqueduct. I have tried this method, and I know that it is not as labor-intensive and yields more water. Or we can channel the flow of water through irrigation ditches. This results in deeper saturation of the soil and lasts longer, which makes less work for the gardener. Or the water may come directly from an abundant rain. This is when the Lord waters the garden himself, without any effort on our part. And this is by far the most effective method of all. It is important to me to apply these four ways of watering the garden to the four degrees of prayer to which the Lord in his great kindness has sometimes raised my soul. Remember, water is the only way to maintain the garden. Without it, everything will die. May it please his goodness that I manage to speak in such a way that it might be of some use to one of the men in particular who has ordered me to write this. In four months, this man has made more spiritual progress than I have made in 17 years. He has prepared himself better, so without any labor on his part, his garden is watered in all four ways, although he only receives the last kind of water in drops. At this rate, you will soon be submerged. If this man finds my description amusing, he is more than welcome to laugh at me. We might say that beginners in prayer are the ones who draw water from the well. As I have mentioned, this requires a lot of labor. Accustomed to a life of distractions, they exhaust themselves trying to recollect their senses. Beginners need to practice withdrawing their attention from what they see and hear. They should sit and solitude and reflect on their past life. As I will explain later, everyone needs to spend some time thinking about her past, but the extent to which each person must do this varies. In the beginning, this kind of reflection is painful. The practitioner is not sure if she genuinely regrets her transgressions. The clearest sign of repentance is her burning desire to serve God. All she needs to do is meditate on the life of Christ and her intellect will exhaust itself. And so, there are certain things we can do to advance on the path. But we must always remember that everything we do is with the help of God. Without His support, as everyone knows, we cannot think a good thought. This phase corresponds to fetching water from the well. May God grant that there is water in it. All we can do is our part. Dipping our bucket and drawing it up to water the flowers. God is so good that if even the well is dry, he sustains the garden without water and makes our virtues flower anyway. Like good gardeners, we do whatever lies in our power and leave the rest to him. His majesty has a purpose for everything, and this aridity may ultimately be to our advantage. What I mean here by water are tears of love longing, or at least a tenderness of interior devotion. 
But what happens when many days go by and all the gardener experiences is dryness, distaste, and a total lack of desire to even bother to draw water? Only the thought that what she is doing gives service and pleasure to the Lord of the garden keeps her from giving up. She needs to carefully guard whatever merits she has gained so far from the tedious labor of letting the bucket down into the well shaft and hauling it up empty over and over. Often she will find that she cannot even lift her arms for this work or come up with a single worthy notion. When I speak of trying to draw water from a well, what I mean, of course, is engaging the intellect in meditation. What then? Well, then the gardener rejoices. She is consoled and considers it an incomparable blessing to be able to work in the garden of such a great emperor. Her purpose is to please him not herself. And knowing that her labor is pleasing to him, she praises God with all her heart. The master has confidence in the gardener because he sees that without any compensation, she so carefully tends what has been entrusted to her. Let her also help Christ to carry his cross. Let her remember that the Lord lived with this cross all his life. Do not let her ever abandon the path of prayer or seek God's kingdom here on earth. Even if this aridity lasts throughout her whole life, let her resolve never to let Christ fall under the weight of his cross. The time will come when the Lord will repay her all at once. She does not need to be afraid that her labor is going to waste. She is serving a good master, and he's keeping his eye on her. She must ignore her negative thoughts, remembering that the spirit of evil tried to use such tricks on St. Jerome in the desert. These trials take their toll. I should know. I endured them for many years, and I know how extraordinary they are. Whenever I was able to squeeze a drop of water from the sacred well, I considered it to be a mercy from God. Such labor seems to me to require more courage than many worldly tasks combined. But I have clearly seen that God does not fail to reward us generously even in this lifetime. A single hour tasting His glory more than compensates me for all the anguish I have suffered in persevering for so long in prayer. I believe that the Lord sends these trials in the beginning and many other temptations later to test His lovers. Before He is willing to lay great treasure inside us, we need to prove that we are capable of drinking from his chalice and carrying his cross. It seems to me that his majesty puts us through all this to remind us of our insignificance. The blessings he will give to us later are so exalted that he wants us first to experience our own imperfection so that what happened to Lucifer won't happen to us. Is there anything you could possibly do, my beloved? that is not for the greater good of the soul? You know that she is already yours. She places herself in your power. She will follow you wherever you go, even to death on the cross. And she is determined to help you bear that cross and never leave you alone with it. Those who see this kind of determination in themselves have absolutely nothing to fear. Spiritual people, do not be distressed. Once you have been placed in such a high state that all you really want is to leave the cares of the world behind and commune in solitude with your God, the majority of your work is done. Praise the Lord for this and trust in His goodness. He never fails His friends. Cover the eyes of your mind and banished thoughts such as, why has God given that person an experience of devotion after only a few days of practicing prayer and nothing to me when I have been hard at work for so many years? Let us trust that it's all for our own good. Let His Majesty lead the way along the path He chooses. We do not belong to ourselves anymore. We belong to God. He grants us an immeasurable blessing when He gives us the desire to dig in His garden and be in the presence of the Lord of the garden, who is certainly present within us. What difference does it make if he gives me water from the well to nurture some of these plants and flowers, while others thrive without it? Your will be done, O Lord. Help me never to forsake you.
Whatever virtues you have in your great kindness bestowed on me, let them not be lost now. Since you suffered, my beloved, I am willing to suffer. Manifest your will in me in every way, and do not give anything as precious as your love to anyone who only serves you expecting to get something in return. I know from experience that those whose souls progress are the ones who set out on the path of contemplative prayer with determination and persuade themselves to ignore whether the Beloved is giving them the blessing of tenderness and devotion or is withholding it from them. If they succeed in detaching from self-gratification, neither rejoicing when the Lord gives them these favors nor becoming discouraged when they are taken away, they should have no fear of falling back, even when they stumble. The foundation of their building rests on solid ground. They understand that the love of God is not about tears or tenderness or relief, but serving Him with humility, fortitude, and righteousness. Otherwise, all they do is take without giving anything in return. Poor women like me, on the other hand, are weak lacking fortitude. It seems appropriate to me that we would be led with holy favors. These gifts are leading me even now, instilling me with the strength I need to endure some of the trials God has given me to suffer. But it appalls me to see prominent, well-educated, and highly intelligent men making such a fuss because God has not given them devotional experience. I don't mean that if God does choose to grant them this consolation, they should not accept it and cherish it. Because if this happens, it is God's will. But if they are not moved by devotion, they should not wear themselves out trying to conjure it up. They should understand that if His Majesty is not giving it to them, they don't need it. They should take control of themselves and move on. They need to see their desire for consolations and prayer as a fault. Not only have I witnessed this, but I have proved it true. Such cravings are the artifact of imperfection. They reflect the lack of both freedom of spirit and the courage to overcome adversity. I am emphasizing this because it is very important to cultivate such freedom and determination. This is less of an issue for beginners than it is for those who have made some progress. Many people start on the spiritual path, but never reach the end. I think this is because they refuse to embrace the cross at the onset. Believing they are accomplishing nothing, they become despondent. They cannot bear it when the intellect ceases to function. They do not realize that when the mind is stilled, the will is growing strong and robust. We need to realize that the Lord does not care about the things we worry about. They may seem like faults to us, but they are not. His Majesty already knows our misery and our inadequacy better than we could ever know ourselves. He also knows that all we really want is to think of Him and love Him always. It is our determination that He desires. The suffering we create for ourselves has no other purpose than to disquiet our souls. Then if we fail to profit from an hour of prayer, we waste four more hours fretting over it. Sometimes the problem actually stems from a physical condition. I have a great deal of personal experience in this matter, and having carefully analyzed it and discussed it with spiritual people, have confirmed that what I say is true. We feel so miserable that our poor little imprisoned souls end up sharing in the misery of the body. Changes in the weather and our natural body cycles prevent us from doing what we really want to do and causes all kinds of suffering. This is not our fault. The more we try to force ourselves at times like these, the worse our condition becomes and the longer it lasts. We need to use discernment and take care not to smother the poor soul. We need to acknowledge when we are sick. Then our spiritual practice may have to be adjusted. Sometimes these changes will be necessary for several days. Let us suffer our exile as best we can. It is a sad thing. When a soul in love with God realizes that she is a host to such a wretched guest as the body, which prevents her from doing what she really wants. The reason I mention the need for discernment is that sometimes it is the spirit of evil that is causing the problem. 
Just as it is not always a good idea to torture the soul into doing what she is incapable of doing, it is not always appropriate to give up on prayer the minute we encounter severe turmoil and distraction. We do have alternatives. We can engage in certain external activities, such as works of charity or spiritual reading. Sometimes, of course, we are not even well enough for these. In that case, let us serve our body out of love for God, remembering all the times the body has served the soul. A genuinely holy conversation can function as an authentic spiritual practice. Our guides might also recommend that we spend some time in nature. Experience is a great teacher because it helps us to see what is best for us and to realize that God can be served by everything we do. His yoke is easy. It is of the utmost importance that we do not drag our souls, as they say, but lead them gently. In this way, we will make much better progress. I don't care how many times I repeat myself. I must return to this essential advice. Do not let feelings of emptiness or distracting thoughts distress you or disquiet your soul. Do you desire liberation? Do you wish you weren't always so troubled? Then do not be afraid of the cross. You will see how the Lord helps you to carry it. Then you will make joyful progress and find blessings everywhere you look. It is clear that if the well is dry, we cannot put water in it. Still, it is equally true that we should never stop dipping our buckets, because when there is water there, God uses it to multiply our virtues.